Welcome to the Renegade Politics Podcast, where you'll understand politics from an expert perspective. On the web at renegadepoliticspodcast.com. I'm going to start doing two things in this podcast. One, actually, I guess three things. One is recording on Sunday. Second thing I'm going to start doing is giving you some direct campaign advice for if you have a political campaign. If you don't, you're going to learn from it anyway. And the third thing I'm going to do is pick a topic that is changing media that happened this week or something that you have to know about that if you have a campaign. You have to understand how things are changing or how something is going to be a surprise. You're going to wake up one morning and you're going to say, how did this happen? And you're going to know before you say that because you would have heard it on this podcast. I promise you. That's what I do. It's who I am. I am the renegade. Renegade Politics Podcast at gmail.com. You can email me. Um, overcoming media bias in your campaign or with your campaign. And later on, I'm going to talk about the pending minimum wage crisis, which is a lot worse than you understand it to be. I'll tell you what they want you to think. I'll tell you what the opposition is talking focused on right now, but then I'll tell you what is the big problem. What do you do when the truth is so controversial that a lie is the only thing allowed in the media? You think we're there yet? What the news is, has always been um, controlled by a small group of people, CBS, ABC, NBC, New York Times. So how do you get across an opinion when that opinion is contrary to those people in their opinion. Because guess what? If they're writing the news and you don't agree with them, guess what happens? Don't have to answer that. And that's basically what you're doing. If you're a challenger campaign, and this podcast is specifically, mostly for challenger campaigns. That means you're not in power. You disagree with those in power because that's the only way you can get in power. You can't agree with the guy you're running against. I've seen that, by the way. Never win. Uh, I'd just like to say that my opponent is doing a pretty good job. I, I am running against him, and let me tell you why. You just lost the camp. You might as well pack it up and go on home. You just lost. The truth may not be politically correct enough to print, so what do you do? Uh, I have an article here. This is what's going to end up happening, and it's kind of interesting. This is Daily Caller story this week. Microsoft just announced that the tech giant's Edge web browser will feature a NewsGuard plugin. It will display a big red exclamation mark and a scolding warning when users view news outlets its sensors dislike. Um, warning, this is bad. This opinion is wrong. I don't know what it's going to say. Warning, not approved news. It's not approved. We'll approve the news. This just drives home the point. The point that you cannot count, you can't even think that the media is going to help you. And when you get your message out, it's going to be distorted in the media, let me give you a quick example of what Donald Trump does and why Donald Trump does it. Now, most people think Donald Trump uses Twitter because he's just such a dummy. He, just, he, just, he can't help himself. He just gets on Twitter and he goes crazy. But every time he says something that's seen as nutty or crazy or stupid on Twitter, more people subscribe to his Twitter account to the point where there are so many people looking at this guy's Twitter account that people will look at his Twitter account for news instead of the news. Get it? See, see what he's doing? You don't get people don't get that. Because you issue a statement in the media. And, and again, this is this podcast is not for how to write a press release. I'm just saying in general, you get some message out in the public talking, people talking about it, enough to to the point where the media picks up on it. And guess what happens? The media will wreck it. They will do something wrong, probably. Donald Trump controls what he says when he does it on Twitter. Because those in power want to stay in power. 
and they will control the relevance of the discussion. I remember, well, do I toot my own horn? Yeah, I'm going to toot my own horn. Why not? I remember about 20 years ago or something like that. I was in my 20s. And I had written a letter to a, a pretty big, I, I did things all the time with media. I don't remember what, how I got it, or a letter or something, a message. And they answered it in the paper. It was kind of a, uh, I, I'm stupid for bringing this up. I said, Bob, Bur something along the lines of, Talking about race relations, well, Bob Byrd was a member of the KKK, and he was a Democrat. And right now, every Democrat United States senator, senator votes for Bob Byrd for President Pro Temp, which is this kind of uh, you know, leadership position in the U.S. Senate. And at the time, it was, ah, who cares? It was so long ago. And they, well, this guy, who cares? So long ago. But as you know now, well, times they are changing. Speaking of which, in the 1700s, pamphleteers started the revolution. I don't know if you know that. Pamphleteers, they just, they printed their own media. And that is what you really basically are doing when you're running a campaign. You can't get your media out. If you're a big campaign, you can use Twitter. You can use Instagram. You can pay for ads on Facebook. You can pay for ads on YouTube. So when somebody logs in to watch a Duran Duran video from 1987, all of a sudden here's a 20-second ad from you that plays before the ad. That, that's great if you can afford it. Now, if you're running for Congress or below, you probably can't. So you've got to do other things. Big campaign, do whatever you can to, get, to control the message yourself directly. Because you say A plus B equals C, and the media says, uh, A plus B equals F. Or, or they'll take a chance to mock you about you thinking the C is the product of A and B. I don't want to get too much into this or be confusing. But hopefully I made my point. You're not going to get your message correctly through the media. It's, it's probably not going to happen. Person to person is more important. Small campaign. Uh, direct outreach. Because you can't afford to have... YouTube ads, it costs a lot. This kind of thing about Microsoft censoring what's news and what's not, it's more about understanding how the media in control, how the editors, how the writers, how they think, than it is about what's going to happen. Yes, we will wake up in a, in a world where you just can't say certain things. You're just not going to be published. It's not going to happen. It's not going to be allowed to be news. So many things are going through my head. I don't want to turn that this into that kind of podcast. So let me let me reel it in and say this. If you want to connect with voters, you cannot just send press releases. You cannot just state facts. You cannot just make points. And you cannot just attack your opponent. You can do negative things. I'm going to read Newt Gingrich in 1994 here. I think it's 93 or 94. Here's what he said. Quote, it is impossible to maintain a civilization with 12-year-olds having babies, 15-year-olds killing each other, 17-year-olds dying of AIDS, and 18-year-olds getting diplomas they can't read. Wow. Doesn't that paint a picture? Doesn't that connect with you? I mean, it, it's, at least in the 90s, it connects with voters. Facts can be manipulated, but if you can make a connection with voters, you will bond with voters. And you can say things like, you can say, I'm trying not to get current in any mess going on right now in politics, but you can say things different ways. You can say, should an illegal alien be able to take your job? Or you can say, I want my children to live in a world where they don't have to worry about someone illegally coming into the country and taking their job. It makes a little bit more of a connection, don't you think? It just came off the top of my head. I'm not, don't use that. I'm just saying you, you've got to make a connection with the message. The message has got to be a, a picture that you're painting. 
something that you represent. I helped a candidate, and he won in a campaign very recently. And he was running in an area that's kind of transient. There are a lot of people coming in from big city nearby. And the people are very protective about the lack of you know, regulation, the lack of big city politics kind of thing. They, they were kind of left alone in this area, right? So he's running for office there. And he's just kind of doing his thing. Here's why I'm running. And here's and he could be sort of looked at I, possibly as kind of a big city guy because he is. So I said to him, why don't you just talk about, you know, the, you share these people's values because you do because he does. That's why he moved there. I said, just talk about the values there. And he went around and he said, I don't know what he said exactly, but I like to think he said something like this. You and I share a, a common set of values here in this town. And there are people who would attack those values, have them changed, altered, destroyed. And we've got to stand up against that and ensure that our community can continue to be the community that we have today. Isn't that a more powerful thing than I want to cut taxes and cut regulation? If you make a connection with a voter, you have bonded with a voter. And and even if you make a mistake after that, they'll 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 You ever wonder why some of these communists are in office and they do crazy things, but the voters still send them back to Washington? Why? Because of that. Because they think, well, he's a little he's a little off his off, off there. I don't agree with that, but you know what? I like the guy. I just, I really just like him. I like what he represents. You've got to represent something when you're running and you've got to do that through media, whether it's a pamphlet or a, a brochure or something side by side. I love the side by side mailing the six by 11 is it six by 11 postcard. There's my opponent. Here's me. You've got to represent something. Here's what you don't do that you see a lot of, especially on social media. Make a statement that makes a couple points. And we like to do that. You know, make three good points and one kind of weak point. You know, here, here are the four points I have. One, this, two, that, three, this, and four, that. The other side will find the weakest point, point four, Ignore point one, two, and three, and beat you over the head with point four. That's what. That's exactly what happens with every Facebook conversation on Facebook right now. I can guarantee you. Go look right now. Guarantee it. Here's what I think, and here's why I think it. And by the way, this. And then someone else will come up. What do you mean by the way? This. What is? What do you mean by the way? This. And, and I'm when I'm saying that I mean having content there. I'm sick of people robbing houses in this neighborhood. And they're driving around in their BMWs and they're robbing houses. Then the response is, what do you mean BMWs? And someone else, what's wrong with a BMW? Someone else, oh, I have a BMW. I'm not robbing houses. See what happens? But when you paint a picture and you say something like, I really, I'd like to live in, I'd like to wake up in the morning and not go downstairs to my car through my garage and find that someone has stolen something out of my garage. And when I get home, I like to know that no one has robbed me while I was at work. Doesn't that second thing, doesn't it paint a picture? It connects with people, connects with voters. Nobody wants to wake up and find that in the night someone has stolen something out of their garage. Nobody wants to come home from work and find that someone has stolen something out of their house. You can make a point or you can make a connection. And if you make a connection, if you, if you paint a picture, you can overcome the bias. You, you sidestep the media bias. Because the media is there. The sensor thing here is Microsoft. Said, that's there. It's, it's looking for little points you make. Like, uh, yeah, taxes are lower. That's a good thing. And if you say directly, taxes that are lower, that's a good thing. Well, it's going to get flagged. And it's going to say it's fake. And it's not true. And look at this. And here's why we need high taxes. If you paint a picture, you're sidestepping all that. The media, you'll probably sneak by the media. And it's not going to be seen as something that's on, on, the, on the talking points for one of the political parties. When you paint a picture and you make a connection and you use a little bit of creativity, a little bit of common sense, you don't have to worry 
about being flagged as incorrect news? Who's going to argue with you at the train stop? Hey, you know, I just, I want to live in a world where, I don't know, you know, our kids have jobs and, and, and not a lot of student loan debt and, and you can afford to buy a new car every couple of years and you can afford to buy a, a, a new house, upgrade your new house every 10 years or so. Wouldn't that be a great world? Who is going to oppose that? Now, you've got to have meat on the bone. You've got, to, you've got to have facts to support that. But you draw people in with what your vision is. What do you want? And I've just, I've been doing this for so long. I've been doing this for a very long time, for years. And I feel like almost every campaign doesn't do that. Just about every campaign. I mean, look. And I got to tell you, Democrats do a way better job than us Republicans do of this when they when they do do it. Because I'm, I'm analyzing Republican campaigns because I'm a Republican, even though I'm trying not to make this a partisan thing. I probably am. But who cares, right? But you look at these websites, you look at these flyers, and it's just, it's a jab, it's a poke, it's a fact. Nevada campaign last year. We don't want Nevada to turn into California. Okay, well, what, what, what do you want? What do you want then? Never said what they wanted. U.S. Senate candidate incumbent never said what he wanted Nevada to be. Governor candidate who is incumbent attorney general never said what he wanted Nevada to be. AG candidate never said what he wanted Nevada to be. Guess who lost? All three guys. You've got to connect with the voters and what you want to see the district or the, the area. Like the friend of mine. Hey, I believe in these shared values we have. We, we've got to protect our values. That's the most important thing to me. Protecting our values against people who come in and try to change the, the way we live our lives. These values are important to us. Here are the values. This, this, and this. And you say what the values are. And you prove to the voter that you believe in their values. Now, I'm not saying just say values, values, values. I'm saying make a connection. Make a connection based on what you're, why you are running. What really motivated you to run? If it's just to get a job, I don't know. I guess I can't help you there. But if you see a problem in society and you're running because you, you have see that problem, make it an issue. One of the things that I, I'm just, this just popped into my head. I hate professional licensure. I think it's a horrible thing. A license, every guy, a license for everything. A license for a milk carrier and a licensed bartender and a licensed, uh, I don't know, sh you know what shoveler. You can just sit here and say, I'm running for office because I want to get rid of these professional licenses. I think that's ridiculous. And most people are going to look, you know, huh? But if you instead say to them, I, I like to live in a society where if you lose your job as a, as a uh, banker, you can become. You can go and bartend the next day without going through three months of bartending school to get your bartending license. Isn't that a little more compelling? Now that's not probably not the best thing to run on, but you're going to overcome the natural media bias by painting your picture, painting your vision, and running on that, and let the facts kind of slip in. Just sit with a piece of paper or and type a paragraph on why why you're running. Try to pick some things out of that. Or have a brainstorm meeting or whatever. Just don't get caught up with the back and forth of who's right or wrong on different facts. Because when you do that, you've already lost. And most candidates do that. Uh, in the last administration, we've lost 2% of the workforce. And blah, blah, blah. No. That's just, it's not compelling enough. You've got to beat an incumbent. And you don't do that by boring. Okay, so I'm starting to bore myself talking about this. But that's, that is how to overcome media bias. You cannot run up the middle. You've got to sidestep the media. And you've got to paint your picture and paint your vision. Um. The thing I want to talk about that I saw, I predicted a long time ago on the radio. 
and this is something that you, you get. I, I don't think here, this is what bothers me when I when I'd be on the radio or I'd do politics. I'd see a story, and then I would see the Republican reaction to it, and neither one was really talking about the real issue here. Uh, talking about the minimum wage. It's becoming a big issue. If you have a political campaign, you probably are going to have to deal with it somehow. Here's a New York Times article this week. After winning a $15 minimum wage, New York City, or New York State maybe, I don't know, but definitely New York, $15 an hour minimum wage, fast food workers are now battling unfair firings. Its workers were the first to stage rallies demanding a minimum wage of $15 an hour. Now they're asking the city council to shield them from being fired without a valid reason. Which, you think that was contemplated when they did the $15 an hour minimum wage? They want just cause for firing workers. And uh, appeal dismissals through arbitration. And at this point... If you must pay your employees $15 an hour, you cannot fire them unless you have a good reason so good that a third party installed by the people who passed the $15 minimum wage and demanded by the people who don't want to get fired decides that you had just cause. At that point, who is really employing your employees? And the real issue here with the minimum wage it's not really about loss of jobs. Everybody says, well, you know, we're going to lose so many jobs that way. That, bad. That, you're not going to, I don't know. I, obviously, that's not working, the whole approach. So let's ash can that approach. How's that? Let's tell the truth. The SEIU, the union, is putting in place a strategy that starts in New York but doesn't end in New York. Reading from the article. And then later it says, Somebody who uh, is part of the SIU. Is that, yeah, I think so. No, no, no. Some guy with some, I don't know what, per law project. No one should fear being fired for no reason at all. What this will lead to, what this is all about, the minimum wage. I remember, let me make, tell a quick story and I'll explain. When I shut down a business I had. Oh, no, that didn't happen. This was before that. When I had employee quit, I got a call from the state uh, revenue department the next year. They, call, they sent me a bill, actually, for the taxes for this employee that quit a year earlier from my business. And I called them up and I said, what are you doing? I, why, you want me to pay taxes for them? Why? Well, you didn't pay taxes for them. I said, well, they quit. And they said, oh, okay, well, can you provide documentation? Documentation of what? That they quit? They, they're not here? That's where this is going. You own them. You hire someone, you own them. Well, you don't own them. I'm sorry. They own you. <laughs> That's what I was thinking in my mind. They own you. You must pay for them. And you can't get rid of them unless you've got just cause. The, it's so destructive. It, it, the way to argue it is through freedom. And I've never had anybody combat this in the whole time of our, anywhere. Do you want to live in a society that tells businesses who they can hire, when they can fire them, and how much they pay them? And no one in their right mind will say yes. To give government the control to decide who is hired, who is fired, and there are so many efforts going on, call them an effort if you want, to make that a reality. This is just one of many, the minimum wage. Because when does the minimum wage end? $15 an hour, $20, now what? $20, then $25, then 30 it is, it is there not to simply say a, a price that is fair, because no price is fair. Nothing is fair. No, no amount is fair when their need is there that's higher than the amount, right? Never. So you, guy, guy making 15 bucks an hour, you better believe he may have a need 
to for $20 an hour or $30 an hour or $50 an hour. The need is always going to be higher. And the government knows that businesses cannot afford to pay people, everybody, a million dollars an hour, right? So this isn't about that. This is about setting up the system that ensures that people aren't being fired for without just cause. This is everything about growing the government. And if you're arguing this in your campaign or this comes up in your campaign, you, you should make the point that this is not about setting a minimum wage. This is about deciding that government is going to control private businesses and private industry. And when that happens, we're not going to have our fancy cell phones. We're not going to have our fancy laptops, our cars. The government will take over everything and control everything. Now, that may not work for a 21-year-old who's going to look at you and, eh, okay. But the 51-year-old's probably going to understand what you're saying. That's what this is all about. Now, I, I do these podcasts. Compl I do not do, I do very little amount of prep as far as, uh, yeah, prep, I guess I do very little amount of prep. So I'm not saying to copy things down verbatim that I'm saying, don't do that. What I'm trying to do is open up your mind and have you look at issues in a different way. If you are running on a campaign, and this fits in with my earlier point about sidestepping the media narrative, the media has spent a long time figuring out what are the two sides on this $15 an hour minimum wage? And the media has spent hours figuring this out. If you come along and you have option three, you're going to confuse everybody and you're going to get some of your message in because the media is not going to know how to react to it. They'll probably try to marginalize you. But the two sides of the minimum wage, well, you're gonna, if you raise the minimum wage, then you're going to lose all these jobs. And the other side says, but people can't afford to live without the minimum wage, what it is, or what it, whatever it is we're proposing. Those are the two sides. But when you say the minimum wage, as it's being contemplated, as it's being put together, because of this New York Times article with proof, is not about setting a, a fair wage. It's about putting government in control of private business. Is that what you want? And you'd be very surprised who doesn't want that. Take a look at who the president is, for example. So to recap, I guess I would say the following. If you want to overcome the bias media, they're always going to be, they're always going to have bias and they're always going to be probably against you because the media by definition is going to want to support whoever's in power now because they're the ones who are feeding them the information. If you want to overcome that, you've got to make a connection with voters. That's a powerful connection. That you, it's a well thought out. You can't cheap this. You can't trick people. People are smart. Together, they're smarter. Don't believe voters are dumb. They're not dumb. They know what they're doing. They may say one thing, but they're, they know what they're doing. Paint a picture. Make a connection. If you can't figure out a way to represent the people in your district, you probably don't uh, deserve to win. You've got to not compel voters to vote for you, but you've got to compel voters to know you so well that they believe that you really have their best interest in mind. But you better have their best interest in mind because you're not going to fool anybody. So that's how you do it. That's how you overcome the media bias by uh, maybe being a little bit different. How's that? I'm not selling anything. I don't sell products. Don't sell my advice. You can get on renegadepoliticspodcast.com. Renegadepoliticspodcast at gmail.com is my website. You can ask me a question if you want. I will answer you. I appreciate if you forward this podcast to anybody who's interested in, in running. And listen to this stuff. Just open your mind up. The biggest problem for candidates, I believe, are listening to just bad advice. So don't do everything I say, but please think about everything I say. That's all I ask you to do. 
And you know what? You might just benefit from it. Who knows? Next week, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but uh, Sundays, 